if it's a true artist, it ain't about the money. It's not about the brand. It's not about any of that. It's about did I move the people? I'm going to read for Oliver Stone. And when I read for Oliver Stone, he says, well, you're just no good. I was like, what? You're no good. You're no good. He told you that. He tells me this to my face. You're no good. Because once you rest and once you say it's over, I've gotten to the mountaintop, then your talent starts to dwindle too. Need motivation? Watch top 10 of the living nation. What's up, it's Evan. My one word is believe and I believe in you. I believe you have Michael Jordan level talent at something and I want you to find it, embrace it and use it to make a difference. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew on today's lessons from a man who went from being adopted by his mother's adoptive parents and growing up in a racially segregated community to becoming a Grammy award winning musician and Oscar winning actor He's Jamie Foxx, and here's my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy! Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, take responsibility. We did this movie where I played this guy where he said, hey, you know what, uh... You know what, Steve, I'm just so happy to be here. So I, I, I did, I played Ray Charles, and I, you know what, I'm gonna make it do what it do, baby. Yeah. And when we played Ray Charles, we didn't know what we were doing in that movie. That was an independent movie. It went on to get nominated for an Oscar. Here was the problem, though. When we got nominated for an Oscar, I thought there's no way we win. So I used that as an excuse to throw parties. Let's turn up, right? Yeah. Then I get a call from somebody. Hi, Jamie Foxx. <laughs> this is Oprah. I'm like, who? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? What? Who's that? This is Oprah. She says, you're blowing it. I said, what you mean? She says, you got an opportunity to do something great, walk into the history books, and you're blowing it. And I need to help you with it. And I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry what I need to do. So she took me to Quincy Jones' house. Oh, and Quincy came out, hey man, father. hey man, you're doing a great job with Ray, man. <laughs> man, you, man, you really did that, man. I remember Michael, man, 54 million records with Thriller, baby. I remember that, man. <laughs> man, but you have to walk a certain way, Jamie, because you don't want to blow it, man. Everybody's counting on you, man. And I said, thank you. And he takes me into his house, and there was people from the 60s and the 70s that had been actors and actresses, all dressed up to say, walk the right way do the right thing, because we counting on you, because we never would have thought this would happen. And so Oprah comes up, she says, I wanted to do this for you because you need to understand the significance of things. And a lot wow. of times people don't understand that. She says, now, are you ready to meet the person that you're here for? I said, yeah. And standing over uh, in the corner was Sidney Portier. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Go up to Sidney Portier and Sidney Portier, yeah, I mean, you know, I, Saw you one time. This dude do anybody, man. I saw you. He said, I, I saw you at a party. Do you remember that? And I, was, I just started crying. I was like, man, yeah. And he says, your performance made me grow two inches. And I was like, I appreciate it. And he says, Oprah and I would like to give you one thing. I said, what's that? Responsibility. She so, said, so you're responsible for your art, you're responsible for this moment. And so that's the Oprah Winfrey who took that moment to where I could have blew it in the club, and we ended up walking through and making history and, and everybody felt like, wow. Rule number two, move the people. What makes me happy, man, is seeing the result of you creating something in your living room or in your bathroom, an idea, a joke, a song, and then seeing the whole world repeat it. Like when I, when I was on In Living Color, everybody was, in, was competing. Back, that was 92, 93. We were competing on that show. Jim Carrey, the Wayans Brothers. We was like, who could come up with the line or the joke that everybody will say the next day on Monday? Like I came up with uh, playing this character. and was like, I'll rock your world. And then next thing you know, our rock your world became T-shirts and all these, or uh, or she take my money and love me leave. <laughs> to to actually come up with that to barge in on Kanye's studio session when I wasn't on their record, and they say just come up with something and then sing that line and then be in Milan in Italy 
and sing it and watch people who don't necessarily know how to speak all English but they know the line that's the most incredible thing if, if it's a true artist it ain't about the money it's not about the brand it's not about any of that it's about did I move the people and it, and it, and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be the whole world it could be like a niche like 30 people out of all of these thousands knew that thing that you did and so that's what makes me happy man because it's like it's it's it, it's the ultimate it's the, it's the ultimate gratification you know because it's like now and now in social media it can happen that quick Fast. like you know back in the day you know you had to read about it if you were now people could tell you either you suck that <laughs> sucked don't do that don't do that again Instant or feedback. or we, we dig it so uh, that, that's what it's about that's what makes me happy yeah it seems like you know no matter what you're doing we're all like a force and that force yeah. needs an effect if you're the yeah. wind you need the tall grass exactly. to blow over exactly. you need the trees to you bend need, oh man so, you know. so elegant that was said so eloquent. Rule number three, persevere. Any given Sunday was a, an incredible moment because I was doing the Jamie Foxx show and they were getting ready to cancel us before 100 episodes. So I was like, man, please. And then Any Given Sunday came up and I went in to read for Oliver Stone. Everybody know Oliver Stone, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read for Oliver Stone. And when I read for Oliver Stone, he says, well, you're just no good. I was like, what? You're no good. You're no good. He told you that. He tells me this to my face. You're no good. And I was like, what? what is it? Yeah, it's no good. And then, because the, I, I read for, I don't know what, I read for one of the running backs. Some, it was a, just a part I was reading for. I said, yeah. you're no good. And, and then the, the, the casting lady said, why don't you come back and read for something else? It, yeah, yeah, he could. And as I walked away, Oliver Stone says this, so I could hear it as he's writing something down. Jamie Foxx, slave to television. Oh. And I'm, I'm heated. I walk out, I say, yeah, and then he said something about I was a slave and picking cotton and something. <laughs> you know, I added on to it. Yeah, 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 I think he called me someone, some kind of name out my name. And he's like, Jay, just really like, no, no, it, no. I hate all of stuff, right? And then they had me come back and read for another part, for the part of the agent. And I read, and after I did that, he says, well, you're just no good at that either. <laughs> and I'm like, so I... So well, how did you, but how did, how do you hear that and, and stick with it? It wrecks you, but what it does is it lets you know what you got. Because I left and I said, Kim, I'm never going to do this. Da, 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 da. And I called my agent. I was on In Living Color and I was the greatest on there. And I was, he doesn't know who I am. I'm Jamie Foxx. And they were like, yeah, Jay, but In Living Color was on a cool network. It wasn't a bit network. And Warner Brothers is, is okay now. So not a lot of people know who you are. And so next thing you know, I actually get a call back. You got the part of the agent. So when I, get, when I go back, I said, I'm going to let him know how I feel. So when I, walk, when I walked in there, I said, I'm going to tell you something, man. So what is it? And he was all relaxed. I said, man, you disrespect me, man. You understand what I'm doing, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this. He says, relax. He says, you're good, but you are a slave to television because you're loud. Because on TV, we have to, hey, man, how you feel today? All right, then, so and so. He says, movies are like this. And if you act like that on the movie on that big screen, it's going to be too much. Overwhelming. I said, okay. He said, and also, I got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, the person who I wanted to play the quarterback is not working out. I need to find somebody who can play the quarterback. I said, I happen to, I played quarterback in high school. <laughs> I passed over a thousand yards. <laughs> I didn't tell him about the interception. <laughs> and I said, listen, I don't want to step on nobody's toes. I said, but I can get that. So during that time, I started learning my lines. And every time I came in, he was like, you're terrible. You stink. You got, you got to be the person. You're trying to act like you're being the person. You have to get it. And this is what I learned about a true director. This was a good training for me. So what I did was I got all my homies together. Remember that 97 coupe, the Mercedes? Absolutely. I, I rented, a, 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 got somebody's coupe to drive around. So I had somebody film me in the coupe, and I get out in all my, my, my football gear like we're at training camp. And so I'm throwing, you know, like literally, I'm throwing passes, outs, and whatever. And I came up with this little chant. My name is Willie. Willie Beeman. I keep the ladies creaming. And all my fans got them screaming. Think you can defeat me? You're dreaming. So we did a little, I had a little music set up. I did a little beat and put that together and made this tape, gave it to Oliver Stone. Got hired. 
and that's how I... so 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 it actually it's it's a lesson in perseverance it's a lesson that if somebody to. you don't hear what you need to hear you make it what you want to hear exactly and, and, and you know it because you had a coach who oh, told yeah. you, Mike, you gotta, you have to give more than the next guy. Rule number four, be driven. I had to learn drive. That's why I have my managers to teach me drive or to, you know, push me because you can relax. You can say, oh, I could do that. Oh, I could do that. But are you going to be that person? I know this person. This person that calls me up, man, did you see what Denzel did in that movie, man? And that was, and you're like, he said, I could have. And maybe he could have, but he doesn't have the drive, the Denzel. And so therefore, if you don't have drive, then you never, you, you, you quit cultivating your talent. Because once you rest, and once you say it's over, I've gotten to the mountaintop, then your talent starts to dwindle too. That's why I, the minute the, the, the award season was over, I was at Wet Willie's in, in Miami doing jokes for people just on the street. And I was like, what? just to see what would work. You know, jokes either about the Oscars or jokes about whatever. And then you go to Atlanta and work on your jokes there. So. That hustle, what I call hustle, yeah. is very important because at some point you're going to be able to pull the hustle back just a little bit and then you pick your spots. The time right now is a hustle to set things up so that in the future you're able to cut back just a little bit and just pick your spots. Rule number five, turn your light on. Back in the day, you look at Richard Pryor and they, okay, he did a, a narcot, whatever it was, and we were like, oh, maybe we have to follow that. Right. But you know, that, that wears your tread down. That wears you down. So I just had to, I wake up and, and do a, I wake up and do like this mental check system. I'm in this situation. I'm in a, in a situation where I'm able to create, and that's my job. And then I look at what I could have been doing. And so I turned my light on. I said, I'm going to turn my light on no matter where, no matter if I'm tired or if I'm re whatever it is, I turn my light on and that saves you. Because a lot of people turn their lights off, if you, especially if you look at comedians. Comedians, when they reach a certain, certain plateau and they've done so great, they, they start trying to look sexy and, you know, they trying get to their mind look good. Involved. Yeah, they start working out too much. You know, it's weird. And then they turn their light off and they're afraid to, to be goofy again. When I wake up, I said, I'm not going to be afraid to be goofy. I'm not going to be afraid to be, uh, I'm not going to be afraid to challenge myself. And it's just a mental thing that you do when you wake up. And then once you do that and once you learn how to tap into it, you don't need any of the other stuff. Rule number six, play the right notes. I'm playing with Ray Charles. And we're playing, you know, just sort of bluesy stuff. And then he went into the Stallone's Monk. Yeah. And that's really intricate. And I, and so I you're hit, playing and you yeah, both are doing blues playing, together. And then we're that doing Stallone's Monk. And then I hit a wrong note. He said, hey, you know, why, why the hell would you do that? I said, what? He said, why you hit the wrong note? I said, I don't know. I'm just playing. I hit. He says, listen, take time out to hit the right notes. That's basically what life is, finding the right notes to play. And so I always sort of use that as, you know, I don't know what you call the word, but you know, uh, my inspiration there, how do I now play the right notes? Play the right notes for me as a person because I want to fulfill my thing, but play the right notes for my family. And I think the, the, the trickiest part because he it's, said life is underneath Yeah, the life notes. is underneath your fingers. Under, life is underneath yeah, your life fingers. Yeah, life is underneath the fingers and all the notes are there. You just have to make sure that you find the right notes to play. Yeah. Rule number seven, get confidence. You know what I want young people to get? I want, them to, I want them to get confidence, and I want them to think like I think. I think that there is nothing in the world that I could absolutely be. When we were in Atlanta and we did the Laugh of Palooza, and we do it every, every year, yeah. this was our best year because we're coming off of that Oscar, and we're coming right into this African-American community where these kids are looking, and we had the teens of comedy, these young guys with confidence and, yeah. and swagger and bravado. I said to all you kids in here, I want you to be able to think that every option is open. My grandmother taught me every option is open because when you are on the other side of those tracks or when you feel like you're not, you know, not you're not pretty or that you're not this or whatever that that mentality is going on in the neighborhood, you know, you can stay stagnant in that and you can just stay like, well, I can never, but you really can. And so the most important thing is confidence. Give them confidence and, and let yeah, them but, know. I mean, it's, that's easy to say. It's easy to say, but here's the How thing. How do you get it? How do you get it is this, is that you keep letting them know. You keep going back every year and then you try to, everybody's not going to be able to do what I do. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's not going to be able to be a, a star or act like it. But when we went back to Atlanta, said, I said, how are you kids doing? My young doctors, my young lawyers, my young whatever it is. And just keep giving them confidence. Rule number eight, study the greats. 
growing up I always watched the Tom Jones show or or this is way young this is way, way before you guys times but like watching Johnny Carson or Sammy Davis Jr some of these old heads who sung dance you know did it all like uh, Dean Martin and, and Frank Sinatra and those guys so after you have the natural blessing of the talent it's seeing how oh that's how I put it together mm-hmm. so if you're watching if you're watching Richard Pryor, okay, that's how I put my set together. Or if you're watching Eddie Murphy, oh, that's how you make it a, a superstar look. Because Eddie was interesting. He was able to do all of that. Uh, and for, for some of the young guys, some of the young millennials out there, I was talking about Eddie Murphy the other day. He was like, oh, ain't that the dude to be in the forest with the, with the animals <laughs> like and stuff? Doolittle. Yeah, it, that's what they know. I said, but I knew him when he would, when he had on the blue leather and he was talking trash, you know, and he was, he made being a comedian like fly. Like nobody did that. Yeah. You know, so when you watch Kevin Hart that's an exact sort of uh, 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 the DNA of what Eddie was rule number nine change your environment there was this one instance that changed the way I viewed life mm-hmm. when my friend was 17 I was 16 and I get a chance to go play for this uh, big house you know in Texas out, out in, the, in the country and it's Christmas time mm-hmm. and when I get there I knock on the door and the guy opens the door what's going on here I said well sir I'm here to play for your, uh, your, your, your Christmas party. Then why are two of you here? I said, well, you know, I, he drove. I didn't have a, you know, license. So, you know, I said, is there a problem? He says, yeah, I can't have two niggers in my house at the same time. Now, mind you, I had heard that word said to me so much it didn't buy. I was like, well, okay, well, listen, can, can he just wait in the driveway? He said, he can't wait on the street. And now look, it, it starts at 6.30. Make up your mind. So I told my boy to come back at 8.15, 8.30, which was late for us at that time. And he says, hey, where's your tuxedo? I said, they didn't tell us to get one. He says, well, come on in this room. And he took me in a walk-in closet. And I was like, why has this man got all his clothes in his bedroom? You know, I ain't never seen that like that. <laughs> but he gave me the, Bro- I don't know if y'all remember, the Brooks Brothers suit with yep. the patches. I was of like, course. oh, man. Wow. I got the suede popping. <laughs> so as I'm playing, as I'm playing, oh boy, as I'm playing, right, they're doing uh, black jokes. You, know, you can my, hear them doing jokes. Yeah, they're doing jokes, and they go, oh, man, we're just funning. Come on, now. We're just funning. And, and so I'm just playing. But the reason that I was calm is because my grandmother taught me something called furniture. Since she worked, you know, as a maid, she says, you know, the, the word is furniture. Whenever they're doing whatever they're, they're doing, you're just furniture. Mm-hmm. You don't respond. Right? Mm-hmm. And then the lady of the house says, I apologize for what's going on here. Could you sing us something? And so I said, cool. Chestnuts roasting, no, 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 I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Right? And the guy says, hey, man, I like that, right? Then afterwards, he gave me 100 bucks at night. And I said, hey, man, 100 bucks. Call me nigga every day. I got me $100. You know what I'm saying? I'm cool. 16. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But I remember about to give him the jacket back. And he says, yeah. I can't wear that anymore. And then he made me wait outside up the street. And that night, when Chris, who, by the way, was my best friend who actually lives at my house now, when he picked me up, I said, listen, I got to get out of here. I got I to get out of this place because I'm too smart for what's going on right now. And either I'm going to hurt somebody or someone's going to hurt me mm-hmm. because eventually I, I can't take too much more of, of that. And then that's when I decided to go to college in San Diego. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is tell great stories. Well, how do you go from classical pianist, um, you know, singing, yeah. church, yeah. college, yeah. to comedy? I was always a clown. I was, I was always a clown. I was always clowning in school. I remember in the third grade, Miss Reeves would give me a, a time at the end of class to do jokes and stuff like that. <laughs> Because I was always getting in trouble, but I was smart too. So I would finish my work. I'd be sitting there, with my, you know, make a noise or something. She's like, "Okay, uh-uh, uh-uh." So I'm gonna give you time at the end of class, and I would watch the Tonight Show. So I would watch Johnny Carson, and you know, and yet, did you know that uh, earlier today it was so hot? So I would watch all the Johnny Carson and watch, you know, David Brenner and all the different acts that would mm-hmm. come on there, and I would just use those jokes for my jokes. Well, hold on. Some of those jokes weren't meant for school. I know, but, but here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing. It was only one TV in my house, and it was in the room I slept. So my grandmother had to watch Johnny Carson, so I had to watch Johnny Carson, too. So that's how I got, you know, Lola Falana and all the different... Remember Lola Falana would be on? Give it up for Lola Falana. And it was just amazing. So I would take those jokes. And you know what's crazy about Johnny Carson? Sitting on the couch. We used to, uh, if you sat on the couch, you made it. Remember yeah, that? Yeah. And that was a singer. I don't know if you remember. His, his name was Joe Williams. Dark, t- 
tall. Mm-hmm. Remember Joe? And if I would be sure that someday you would find, and if I would be no right. <laughs> Thank you. But here's the thing: Joe never got a chance to sit on the couch. Right? My grandma said, ooh, I wish one day, I wish that Jesus would just let Joe, (laughs) I wish Jesus would let Joe sit on that couch with Johnny Carson. He sung so well for so many years. Mm. So we sit there, and every every time Joe would come on, we sit like, okay, maybe Joe, maybe Joe will sit on the couch today, right? So Joe was singing, and if I would, once again I sung a song, I haven't sat on the couch. (laughs) Maybe tonight, right? And I guess someone had canceled. Mm -hmm. So Johnny Carson says, come on, sit on the couch, Joe. We was like, yeah! (laughs) But Joe went to run over there because he was so excited. And the microphone cord was tied around his foot. (laughs) And Joe fell. And Joe was like trying to get to the couch. And Joe was trying to get to the couch. And then they went to commercial. (laughs) We were like, damn, Joe. (laughs) That hurt me. That hurt my grandmother. I just can't believe Joe was so close. (laughs) They went to commercial on Joe's ass. Now, I've got a really special bonus clip from Jamie Foxx on how to have energy. But before that, I want to know, what did you learn from this video? What was the single most important lesson that you're going to apply somehow to your life or your business? Let me know. Leave in the comments below. And when you write it down, you're much more likely to actually take action on that thing that you need to improve. So leave it in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is. Much love. I'll see you soon and enjoy the bonus clip. Just a few hundred feet down at the comedy store, there was a guy named Eric Bishop, which is my, actually, that's my real name, Eric Marlon Bishop, who was at the comedy store, who was, just got my jokes. I would literally, I stayed at this place called the Hastings Hotel on Hollywood Boulevard. It's, it's, it's torn down now, but it was just like derelicts and crazy view, and I bought my own and stuff, and I would buy those three-minute uh, burritos from 7-Eleven. <laughs> I, put, I bought me a little microwave, I put it in, and work on my three-minute set while it's cooking. The reward uh, being a burrito. Yeah, they, I finish my burrito and then go down to the comedy show. I'm Eric Bishop. I get on and I get a standing ovation. Everybody's going crazy. Then I came back. I couldn't get back on because the comedians ran the list and they saw that I got a standing ovation at night so they would never put me back on. So I was like, damn. So I started going to other comedy clubs. I ended up at the Santa Monica Improv and they were, they were having the evening at the Improv back in the day. And at that time, like hundreds of guys would show up for the potluck, for the, for the open mic night. And there would be three girls that would show up. The three girls would always get on. So I said, you know what, damn it. I'm going to write on this paper, Stacey Green, Tracy Brown, Jamie Foxx. They end up picking the name Jamie Foxx, thinking that I was a girl. Jamie Foxx, is she here? You're going to go first. I said, no, brother, that's, uh, that, that's me. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and I go up in the middle of the show. They call me Fresh Meat because they were actually taping real comedians. And they said, put the fresh meat up because yeah. they're thinking I'm going to get booed. Yeah. I end up getting a standing ovation. That's when Jamie Foxx was born, about 27 years ago. Jamie Foxx is born, and that's when everything started. And and what was crazy, after that night, people thought I was arrogant because they said, yeah, that's that guy right there that just got the standing ovation. Jamie. And I'm like, Jamie, I'm not used to the name. (laughs) Jamie Foxx. I'm like, this this motherfucker's arrogant. I said, no, I'm just trying to get used to the the name. And then what I did after that, once I got the Jamie Foxx and I added the X because of paying homage to Red Foxx, Jack uh, Letterman's jackets were in at that time like in 1990 so everybody had a Letterman's jacket so I went and saved up got me a Letterman's jacket and uh, I started working on the name so on the back of my jacket said sly as a dot 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 
Nice. So you know, I was nice. so when you talk, but but when you talk about the energy of being Jamie Foxx, that is it, and that's why, like it was on the uh, uh, internet or Twitter, people didn't know that my name was Eric Bishop, and it was like crazy. People were going crazy. I said, yeah, but. Not to talk in third and fourth person, but Eric Bishop centers Jamie Foxx. Like, Eric right. Bishop is Terrell, Texas. Never left that. Never forget that I'm from Eric Terrell. Eric Bishop turns the lights on. Exactly. He turns on the light. He's from Terrell, Texas. Never changed. My family lives with me from Texas. My sister, the 27 years that I've been Jamie Foxx, has never called me Jamie Foxx. She calls me Eric. Yeah. I said, why you don't call me Jamie Foxx? I ain't calling you that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Jamie Foxx. What is that? You better stay real. And it's interesting. Eric Bishop is like Clark Kent. Jamie Foxx is like the Superman. Yeah. And it does take energy to uh, to be Jamie Foxx. That makes sense. Yeah. So let me give you the one word secret to happiness. One word. This is all you need to be happy. The most important word ever. If you had to think of one word that's most important to you or that sums you up or that would be kind of like a little beacon. Hey, Believe Nation, if you want to know what the most important one word is for Tony Robbins, Gary Vaynerchuk, Oprah Winfrey, Will I Am, and Howard Schultz, I have a very special secret video for you. Check the description for details.